Okay. So I have to make people go away. Welcome to our gardening class here at the WCPL part two with Diane Diffenderfer, our master gardener extraordinaire. Oh, I'm no, thrilled <laughs> that all of you are here and that you are going to learn some really great things today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Diane. Thanks, Tracy. It's nice to be here. Um, maybe everybody got a little lesson in how to do Zooms or how not to do Zooms while we were getting ready. Um, Tracy was saved the day and we'll tell you why in a few minutes. Um, but or thanks again, or, or not. Uh, it's one of those things maybe you don't want to tell anybody. I get it. So uh, th so thanks for tuning in tonight. Uh, again, as, ba as um, Tracy said, it's basics two tonight. And I think the next, check me on this one if you would, Tracy. I think the next Food for Thought program is April 8th. Is that yeah. right? April and the 8th. Top yep. Yep. Okay. Um, and the topic is the greenhouse and aquaponics setup at the um, Honesdale High School. And Kayla's going to be the presenter for that one. Right? And yeah. in case you don't, in case you don't know, uh, Kayla, she's the ag, ag ed teacher um, at Honesdale. Okay. So let's go ahead. So this is my public service announcement to all master gardeners and anybody that likes to garden at all. So I took this picture last year on April 18th. So just about a month from, you know, we're about a month away. So here in uh, Honesdale, our growing zone is, around, is 5B. Our last frost-free date is May 15th or so. Um, so this is just a reminder that when we get those nice warm days, like we had, we had one, I sort of remember, um, don't get ahead of yourself, yourself. It's really hard as gardeners not to go out and want to putz around. It's great to weed, but just don't put anything in the soil yet because this is what can happen. And then everybody is very sad. So, uh, just take heed. So, um, let's see. I did just want to throw, you know, this is that. I mean, I love to garden. I love to grow vegetables. I think it's really fun. Um, and I'm glad so many people are interested. I, you know, I think it's like the only silver lining or one of the few silver lining of COVID is that, you know, we see more and more people gardening now. And that's really terrific. You know, it's an exhausting activity sometimes. Sometimes it's invigorating. Um, you know, the garden smells great after a rain shower. And it's really cool when you actually get to grow food and eat it and share it with your friends. So again, uh, if you have questions, please pop them in the q and A. I I think, uh, and we'll, we'll try to answer whatever we can. So here is the lineup for tonight. Uh, we'll have a video, we're gonna start out with that. Uh, then we're gonna talk about fertilizers, watering, succession and interplanting. And then we're gonna talk about pests, soil, insect, uh, weed control, plant diseases, then we'll touch on integrated pest management or IPM, and then we'll make sure that we touched on all of those topics. So I am going to um, stop sharing my screen and Tracy's going to, to share hers. And we're gonna play a video that was prepared by Don Seifert, who is a horticulture educator for the uh, Penn State Extension, okay? So, Diane, the YouTube has actually disappeared <laughs> because well, that's the story of our life. Exactly. Okay. So, if you stop sharing your screen, oh, you want to try to get it again? I was just going to say we. Yeah, um, go for it. What do you want to do? I apologize. It was pulled up and then somehow it yeah. went away. Yeah. But at least you are having a really fun look at my screen. Yeah, um, lots, lots right. of good librarian things there. <laughs> um, um, you want to search and see if it comes up or should we just go on? Yeah, I was just going to search for you. Um, for okay, that's cool. 
And it's ra making creating a raised bed. Building a raised bed. Yeah, put Don's in name in on uh, you know YouTube. Raised bed. Don Seifert. S E I F R I T. I B four E. Ooh. Oops. I think it's S I E. That doesn't look right to me. Well, this did not go according to plan. No, do it the other way. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe it really is EI. Just one more time. Sorry about that. You're a fast typer. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you for tuning in while we are uh, <laughs> having technical difficulties. Well, when I tried to, just so you guys understand what happened, when I tried to pull it up, it didn't play at all. So, you know, I, I went back and forth with it several times today and it was playing beautifully and then the volume was gone and then I couldn't even uh, get it, get the video itself. All right. Finished? Yeah, I'm gonna hop off of. Okay. And let you. I'll go back and try one more time when you yeah, when you. Sorry about that. So I stopped. Yeah. So well, that's okay. You know. Sorry about that, everybody. What if I just hit this? Okay. Let's see what happens with this. I'm out. You can pop back in. Yeah. Oh, can you see it? Are you there? Nope, we cannot see it. You can't see it? No, nope, I'm oh, sorry. Oh man, it's big on my screen and everything. It's right here. <sighs> All right, so let's get- Okay, forget it. What we can do, sorry about that. Yep. Oh, that is so good. Sorry, everyone. This is just so annoying. Okay. Can you see my whole screen? Now we can. Everything's so sorry, okay, everybody. Yes, that's what we get for trying to do a video. I know. Well, I need to go to video school, I guess. Um, so I don't think that'll be happening anytime soon. But so here's, there are a couple of things I wanted to mention about um, raised bed gardening and, or just in general, I mean, I'm sorry that we didn't get to see it, but you know what, maybe I can get it and send it to you guys. I'll, I'll certainly give it a whirl. Um, so uh, a couple of things that are really uh, nice about raised gardens or raised bed gardening is that first of all, you have much better control over the soil. Um, and in that video, you, they built this um, raised bed and they were going to install it on a, um, on a reclamation site. It was a super fun site. And they, so they lined the bottom of the bed in landscape fabric, thinking that that would help to keep the, um, if there was any, still any, um, you know, impurities left in the soil from the reclamation that, that that would help to, you know, take care of it. So, or keep it from getting into the root vegetables. So that's, you know, a, another way to help keep, take care of the soil. I wouldn't, in general, I would not recommend lining a bed with landscape fabric because even though it's porous, it will still retain a lot of water. And that water buildup is almost like having a hard pan of clay at the bottom of your raised bed and the roots will hit that and they'll A, not be able to go through and B, they will not have the oxygen that they need in order to grow properly. So um, if you do see something like that, I would, you know, unless you're on a super fun site that's been reclaimed, I would not do that sort of thing. Um, so you have a raised bed, you get really get to control the soil that goes in there. So be careful with the soil that you do put in. Um, you can put in, you can get, garden soil from a, a big box. You can have someone deliver garden soil to you. You can also 
put in your own compost, mushroom soil. They're all different types of additives. Um, the one thing I would do if you are building a new bed is I would definitely put, do a soil test. And the best time uh, is to do that soil test in the fall so that you can amend the, the, the soil as you may need to. And we'll talk about fertilizers in a bit, but always the best way to amend the soil is to do it in accordance with a soil test as opposed to just dumping stuff in there because more is not always better. Um, so we just wanna be careful with that, okay? The other thing that I think is really nice about a raised bed, is, now this, this is a 12 inch bed. So um, I still have to bend over, but you can make a 24 inch bed, a 36 inch bed, and you can build seats in the corners and you can, you don't have to kneel all the time. I mean, sometimes I didn't, I, I wish I didn't have to kneel all the time. It, and I sit on that little two inch piece and that's, you know, uncomfortable to say the least. So there are a lot of ways that you can modify the bed to make it more comfortable to work in. It also helps to constrain some of the plants that you might have growing a little bit out of control. Like in this, you'll see all that calendula, you know, that that orangey flower at the end, it reseeds itself and it goes wild and it's great. But um, a raised bed does help it, it spreads like mint. That's what it reminds me of. Um, so you, it does help to keep things a little bit more contained than otherwise, than you might otherwise have. And you can still trellis um, in, in a raised bed actually pretty easily. So those are some of the benefits of, of having a raised bed. So let's talk a little bit about fertilizers. Um, there are, a complete fertilizer is, is a, um, a pack of fertilizer, if you will, that contains some amount of each of three, the ma three major nutrients that plants need. And those are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So if you look at this label at the bottom right of your screen, um, XYZ brand, and the guaranteed analysis is 8024. So eight is the number for nitrogen, and this is the percent by weight. And zero phosphorus, and then 24 for potassium. So this is not a complete fertilizer. So if your soil test comes back and says you need a complete fertilizer, which it may or may not, but depending upon where you have your soil test done, that's what it means. So complete, you have all three. And, um, and then the other micronutrients that the plants need, you, you gain or the plant gets through generally the organic matter in the soil itself. Slow release fertilizer um, mean, just means that exactly what it says, that over time the nutrients are released into the soil. And the way that um, that happens is, so, oh, I should mention there, there are three types of fertilizer, basically, granular, liquid, and gas. So for the granular formulations, those are pelletized and they're pelletized with this coating of either a resin or sulfur. And over time, the, uh, that coating erodes away and that then allows for that slow release action of the fertilizer. So um, that's how that works. You, you don't obviously, I mean, one of the nice things I think about slow release is that uh, you, it stays a little bit longer in the soil. So you don't have to keep dumping soil or keep dumping fertilizer on or making multiple applications. Um, you may need to add more later though. Just, it sort of depends on the growing season that you have. So you have to, you know, judge by your plant's growth. Organic fertilizer is made from byproducts actually of everyday life. So um, there can be meat products in it uh, and then plant refuse as well. They're, and these are naturally slow release because um, the way organics work is that the there's a, you know, soil is a living thing, right? So dirt is not, dirt is like people call, people call dirt and soil, they use those words interchangeably. But to a horticulturalist, there is actually a difference. And, you know, dirt is really um, pulverized rock. And soil is a living, breathing um, material. 
And there's a lot of microbial action going on and that microbial activity releases the, nu the nutrients that are in the organic soil or organic fertilizer. And so that is na a naturally slow process because it takes the microbes a while to do that work. Um, and then lastly, you have synthetic or sometimes that's also called inorganic. And while those, uh, the, the, the materials that are put into that synthetic uh, fertilizer may be uh, naturally occurring because they go through this uh, manufacturing process, they're referred to as synthetic fertilizers. Diane, this, yes. is, this is Tracy. Before we move on, someone had uh, their hand up to ask a question. Oh. Are you okay so they don't forget with having that <laughs> unmute? Okay. That's fine. So I'm sorry I didn't notice you earlier. You're listed as owner. You had your hand raised. Did your question get answered or did you want to ask? Okay, they're they're muted again. So okay, well, if you want to, you know, we can, we can ask again we, at the end. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, to go on. Okay. Um, so now we're going to talk about watering, and here's a little video that I think will work. Can you hear it? <laughs> we can this see one. it. You, you can't hear it. No, but I can, uh, I can do the Okay, good, all right. Okay, so everybody, everybody has the idea. So this is a great way, um, many of you may have this type of uh, sprinkler in your yard or at, at your home. Uh, people use it on their lawns, people also use it in their vegetable gardens or on their ornamentals. Um, so we're gonna talk about this type of irrigation are 80 to 90% water. So um, th they obviously need a fair amount of water throughout their growing season. It's also important because within the plant's vascular system, water forms the primary um, method of transportation. So, um, you know, stuff comes up from the roots to the, to the leaves and down from the leaves where they photosynthesize down into the roots. So there's like this two lane, you know, road going on inside the vascular system of the plant and the primary mover and shaker in there is water. So that's why it's so important. In terms of how much water is needed, the, in general, the rule of thumb is about an inch a week. So that obviously, uh, is impacted by the type of soil you, that you have, the weather conditions, not just the amount of uh, rain per se, but also just the humidity. Um, if it's really windy, the wind, wind can dry soil out very, very quickly if it's left uncovered. And that's another reason to put some mulch you know, in your garden is to, to reduce that uh, transpiration out or evaporation from wind. Um, so about an inch a week. When is it needed? There are critical times, obviously, for for plants to be wa to need water. Obviously, if they're if it's if you have drought condition, that's certainly a condition when they need to be watered. But from a from a growth perspective, um, when they are when the the plant is starting to put on its fruit, um, or you know if it's a beet, it's you know when, when the beet is starting to form, it's when whatever it's going to give us to eat starts to grow. Um, it needs the plant needs more water because most of what most of those vegetables are have a significant percentage of water within them. So we want to make sure that they're not um, stunted because of a lack of water. Soil type certainly does matter when we talk about irrigation. You know, last week we talked about clay soil and how it you know water will just sit right on top of it. Uh, it doesn't percolate through. So if you if you get too much water in there and you have a clay soil, the water's not going to percolate and that your roots will not have enough air. I mean, your roots can drown. I mean, that's sort of the answer to the last point on here is can too much water damage the plants? Absolutely, because the plants need, or the roots need both water and they also need air. 
Uh, if you have a really sandy soil, the water will percolate right through and may not hang around you know, the root zone long enough for the plant to get what it needs. So really a nice loamy soil is what we're going for. Um, in terms of what gardening practices conserve water, uh, again, that's the, the big one here is mulch. So regardless if you use a synthetic mulch, uh, you know, like a plastic mulch, or if you use organic mulch, you know, straw, hay, hot, uh, salt hay, something like that, the, one of the primary functions of that mulch is to keep the water, keep the moisture where you want it. And that's at the, um, on the soil level. So it's closer to the, uh, to the roots. Um, so what else should you know about soil and watering? First of all, the ground, the soil should be moist, but not wet. If you, if you're, if you, it, you can, you know, like take a handful, <clears throat> sort of like the way you test compost, take a handful. If you squeeze it and water comes out, it's way too wet. You basically want it to be sort of the consistency of a damp sponge. Uh, the, the, uh, the most ideal uh, irrigation system or way to water your plants is with either a soaker hose or a trickle hose. And the reason for that is that in that irrigation, you know, video that you saw and Tracy did the sound effect for us, um, what, what happens is certain plants, and we'll, we'll take a tomato as an example, they have hairy leaves and a lot of other plants just don't have any hairs at all and some have smaller hairs. So what the hairs do is they can unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Um, so the hairs will actually trap the water on the leaf and that's not good for the plant. So generally speaking for home gardeners, the most efficient and effective way to irrigate your plants is not by standing out and spraying with a hose or not having one of those overhead sprayers, but rather installing either a trickle system or a soaker hose. Uh, that way we're getting the water where we need it. If you happen to be growing stuff on your plants on black plastic or white plastic, um, then you'll have to thread the, remember to put your soaker hose down before you put your plastic, plastic mulch down. Otherwise, you have, you'll have to like thread it underneath once you've done that. Um, it's better to water in the morning and that's so that the leaves, the plants themselves, if they do have moisture on them or, or get water on them, they have a chance to dry off during the day. Um, and it's... Um, I guess that's that's the big one. Just we'll move on from there. Uh, again, know that we need the critical watering period. We talked about that when you they put on their fruit, and if you saw, see any signs of um, uh, less than vigorous growth, so if you see that if it's wilting, obviously it needs a drink. And if you wait till the plant is stressed, it reduces the vigor and it makes it then more susceptible to insect disease or um, or I'm sorry, insect damage or disease. A few words about uh, roots. There are two basic time types of roots: uh, tap root on tap root on your right, like a carrot, and the orifibrous root on your left, which is sort of like a lettucey kind of uh, plant. And the reason that that um, I mentioned this is it's particularly important if you're cultivating, hand cultivating, or using a hoe of some type. You just want to be very careful not to damage the roots. So, like if you if you're if you're um, hand hoeing in a bed of lettuce, then you really have to just sort of scuff the surface and not go too deep because you don't want to injure the roots. And Conversely, if you're if you are weeding in a carrot, you know a carrot patch or something like that, beets, um, you have to be careful not to nick them. Okay, so watch out for the roots. Uh, direct seeded versus uh, transplant. The point here is that we talked a bit, little bit about this last week when we talked about transplanting and how you want to keep the root ball intact and um, during the transplanting process. If you direct seed. You put the seed in the ground and it grows and you never have to move the plant. So that's really the most ideal 
uh, condition and situation for the plant because you're not disturbing the roots. And remember, if you are, if you're planting, if you're transplanting or, or seeding something that needs to be trellised, uh, put the trellis in, you know, put the post in or the, the stakes in at the time of planting or transplanting, again, so that you don't bother the root system. Uh, rooting depth, again, it's just a, a reminder about the hard pan that we talked about. You know, if, if, you, if you form that hard pan with the compressed uh, soil, you're going to have to uh, break it up from time to time. And daikon radishes are good that, for that, carrots are good for that. And it's sometimes it's just really good to deep, dig deeper than you usually do so the roots have a chance to, to grow down. If, and if they hit something really hard, you may get um, sort of oddly shaped plants, which you've probably seen. Um, and just overall, be, be aware of the, the health of the root because it really does dictate in many ways, the health of, and vigor of the overall plant. Worms are awesome um, to have in your garden. You, you know, they, they leave worm castings at the back end and on the front end, they are making tunnels, which create both air space and water space. So this is uh, <clears throat> just sort of a laundry list. We're gonna talk about insects and there are so many different insects that can bother your plants. I think that the, the major takeaway from this slide is that uh, the good thing to do is know the plant, know the insect pests that are in your garden and around your area, and particularly know their life cycle, their, what they look like as an adult, what they look like as an immature insect, because they may look drastically different. Um, some obviously are here, some are imported. The, you know, I was sort of, when I was thinking about this earlier, I was thinking, well, the spotted lanternfly is an excellent example of an imported you know, um, insect. And by the way, Wayne County is now in the quarantine zone. So um, that's an important thing that we need to you know, talk about as a community. Um, so, you know, it, the pro, when you have imported ones, that one of the issues is that they don't have any natural predators. So then it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we deal with them appropriately. Always remember about the beneficial insects. You know, we wanna have uh, bees in our garden and hummingbirds, on, they're not an insect, but you wanna have things flying around. You want those pollinators. And it's a good idea. That's why one reason I think it's a really great idea to grow flowers in the garden, you know, grow, nice pollinator plants so that the bees come in and, and um, fertilize our vegetables. So <clears throat> environmental effects. And some people, you know, we have this garden line and people call, call in and ask master gardeners questions. And one of the things that, you know, they're, they're bringing a, cur a leaf curl, a curled up leaf. And it turns out that, that after asking, you know, a bunch of questions, what you figure out is that a neighbor was spraying an herbicide. It got too, there was a drift. The wind, the wind was coming, you know, from your neighbor to your vegetable garden and it caused some uh, damage to the, to, the, um, to the foliage. So you do have to be aware of that. And, and also it, just in terms of the pests, um, the, a lot of the nurseries, and this is now better, a lot of the nurseries uh, that used to grow seedlings and sell them, used uh, certain pesticides to, uh, you know, to protect the seedlings as they were growing. But unfortunately, a lot of those were neonicotinoids and those neonicotinoids are, um, are fatal for certain pollinating insects. So you wanna make sure that if you're buying seedlings that they were not treated with neonicotinoids. And then there's a variety of, of uh, visual damage cues that you can get um, the, they defoliate, they, they're sucking plant sap. Uh, that's what a spotted lanternfly does. And they actually go after grapevines. Um, they feed on your plant roots, they vector diseases. So um, there are a number of different things that you need to consider. And, and the best way I think to do, to, to figure some of this stuff out is take a walk in the morning and in the afternoon if in your garden and look around to see what's happening. So that way you can catch things early. So here are just a few pests that are pretty common around here. You have the Japanese beetle, 
The larval stage of that is a grub. So um, if you have grubs in your garden, you'll definitely have Japanese beetles and it is possible to control them with something called milky spore and you put that down and it kills the grubs. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But so in the middle at the top, uh, those little black spots are, are flea beetles and those little holes are it's a typical shotgun um, damage done to, this happens to be an eggplant. They love eggplant. Right below that is a striped cucumber beetle and um, they vector, I think, uh, I think verticillium will, you can check me on that, um, but they chew on an infected plant and then they pass that around. On the top right is are the life stages of the Mexican bean beetle. You have the adult in the bottom or middle left. Then you see the eggs, the white eggs at the bottom, and then the little um, nymphs running around, those yellow guys. On the bottom left is the pupa stage of the um, allium leaf miner. So you'll find, and this happens to be in a leak, you'll find these in anything in the allium fan, family. So you'll find it in, um, you see it in garlic, you see it in onions. And if you see this little lump, um, you know, peel, peel back a couple layers of the plant and of the, of the fruit. And if you see that, definitely squish it. And uh, you can use it. It doesn't, you know, you, you can still use the, the the vegetable that where you found it. I would just sort of cut around it. It's relatively new up here. I've only seen it in the past three years. I had uh, before that I hadn't seen it. And then bottom right, aphids on kale. Um, here's some more soil pests, or th these are soil pests. Sorry, that's your grub right there. Um, wire worms. It's also see, I, I put this in here because it's good to know where insects overwinter or where they live. And it could be because that's another way that you can look for them um, in your not only you're just in your land, your entire landscape. So wire worms, they like manure and grass. You have cutworms. Cutworms are a big problem, I think, in the in the home vegetable garden. And one of the ways what happens is literally they cut the stem of a seedling. They just so if you go out and like all you see are um, the stems lying on the ground, then it sounds like you have a cutworm. And the best thing to do is rip, rip out the plant. Some will regrow, but I would probably replace them. And when I put them, when I tr put the transplants in or new seeds in, I would put a collar around, like a um, take a plastic milk jug and cut it so that you know both ends are open. And you place that collar of plastic around the seedling. And that helps to reduce the um, likelihood that a cutworm will get in to uh, cut your plant. You can also use cardboard. Uh, root maggots, uh, they're in grass and, and they will obviously just you know, decimate your roots. Grubs, we just talked about. Um, grubs, I, if you look at this life cycle uh, image at the bottom, the good thing about you know, understanding what your native um, or what insects you have, what pests you have in your garden, that it's very important to, you know, when you treat your, um, when you treat, if you're going to use a chemical treatment, um, how, how and when you do it, what life stage are you trying to affect. Slugs um, and other soft-bodied insects that you may be, soil pests that you may be having problems with. A, a good way to deal with these in an in a organic or in a non-toxic way is to use, is to get food grade diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth is just diatoms are little sea creatures and their, their exoskeleton is a silicon based product or, you know, that's what it is. Um, and so the, the diatoms are all smooshed up, but they remain very, very sharp. If you look at them under a, a microscope, you'll see that they're at, they look like little pieces of glass. So if you have a soft bodied um, insect crawling over a field of food grade diatomaceous earth, they're basically eviscerated. So um, it's, it's a pretty foolproof method of, of dealing with these insects. So, and also I guess nematodes, you have good nematodes and bad nematodes, beneficial nematodes and bad nematodes. And they obviously live in the soil. And for all of these that are in the soil, 
you know, th this is one reason why we do, uh, we recommend a three year crop rotation. So by family, so veg, you know, if you're in bed A, if you have tomatoes this year, you're not gonna grow tomatoes or any member of the solanaceous or nightshade families. So no peppers, no eggplants, um, no potatoes uh, uh, for three years in that bed. And what that serves to do is help to break the life cycle of the, of the insects, the soil borne insects that may be overwintering there. Excuse me, uh, weed control. So some of the benefits of weed control, I think they're all pretty uh, straightforward. You know, weeds will just compete with uh, vegetable plants, uh, the edibles that you're trying to grow, and they'll compete not only for water, but also for nutrients and for light. So keeping them to a minimum is certainly a good idea. Again, pest control, these ins or the, the weeds can serve as a host plant for some of disease and insects. So if we can get rid of that um, sort of safe haven for pests, then we're doing our veg plants a favor. It could also create an environment for disease. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, if, it, if there's heavy foliage, you might find more uh, powdery or downy mildew in there. So again, so it's best to keep, the cleaner you can keep your garden, the better off you are in general. Um, and if your plants are being bothered by weeds that can create a stressful situation for the plant and therefore making it more susceptible and attractive to both disease and insects. I think the best advice really is to control them when they're young, try to get them when they're less than, you know, two inches high and you, you save yourself a lot, a lot of work. The image on the left is, and I put it in here because most people think of it as a weed. It's stinging nettle. Some people eat them when they're very small. Um, and if you have ever run into one, you know that they can be incredibly um, painful and just annoying. But what I learned is that I had a horrible aphid problem on my kale. I showed you that image. And I had, there were some nettles in there. I just let them in the garden um, because I didn't want to dig them out because they're a pain. But I put my kale next to the, in the rotation, the kale ended up next to the nettles and all the aphids went to the, they, they, all, they all disappeared. So um, I sort of feel like that's a, now in my mind's eye, and I know we're supposed to reuse research, research base, but this is sort of maybe one of the companion plant um, things that were, that actually master gardeners are now allowed to talk about a little bit. And remind me, I'll give you the name of the new book. Um, but I feel like it's a companion plant for the kale and it keeps the aphids away. So I was really happy about that. So there's a plant, uh, this new book um, is called Plant Partners. And the author's last name, I think is Wallace. I think it's Veronica Wallace, I forget. But um, it is a book that Penn State Extension is uh, now recommending if you're interested in learning more about sort of research-based companion planting. I would also recommend if you're interested in learning more about companion planting to look at Cornell's website because they have a, they have a lot, a lot of information um, about companion planting and, and suggestions for different types of companion planting. Um, systems. A little bit about plant diseases. <clears throat> so um, there are three types you know, of pathogens that we need to deal with, fungus, fungal, bacterial, and viral. Uh, mostly what we see are fungus. And um, this Venn diagram, I think, sort of puts everything, you know, I like graphics. And so what it says is that in order to get a disease, which is the obviously the bright red spot in the middle, you need <clears throat> excuse me, you need three things. You need a pathogen, a susceptible host, and a conducive environment. It, and only where those three overlap is when you get a disease. So if you have a pathogen and a conducive environment, but not a susceptible host, no disease. Um, so this is another, you know, we talked about what a susceptible host may look like, and it's one that is crowded out by weeds. It's you know, maybe um, it's in a drought condition, it's not being watered properly, but overall it's vigor is less than ideal. So this is another reason why you want to make sure that 
um, that your plants are growing well and the vigor is where it should be. Th these can be soil uh, born, uh, seed born, or carried you know, in the air or in the water. So uh, again, we mentioned this last week, we talked about using an organic mulch versus a plastic mulch. And if you have a fungus and spores on the leaves and you get water, if it rains, you know, the water is going to, the rain is going to uh, dislodge some of those fungal spores. And in that splash, you could bounce and, and, and get another crop if you have a, uh, a plastic, whereas if you have an organic, um, it's likely not to splash and perhaps won't go directly, you know, won't spread. So uh, just another, there's a lot of interplay in all of these things. Uh, environmental conditions have to be proper, to, depending upon what kind of disease we're talking about. And there is genetic resistance, certainly. Um, if you look at the back of the seed packet or look at the description in a seed catalog, the, uh, the resistance factors will be noted for the, the crop that you're, the seeds that you're looking for. So succession planting and interplanting are also often referred to collectively as sort of intensive plantings. Uh, so succession planting is really exactly what it says again, planting one crop after another, planting a spring crop and then a summer garden and a fall garden. It's sort of an example of that. And one of the best examples is in the spring, you wanna plant a cool season crop so that could be peas. And when the peas are finished, you take them out um, and replace them with your tomato starts. They're a warm season crop. They love being warm. And when they're finished in September or so, maybe a little bit later, you can plant um, either arugula or beets or chard, another cool season crop. Radishes are a great one to follow, tomatoes too. So um, that, that really lets you maximize your growing space. It can mess up, I will say from experience, it can mess up your crop rotation a little bit, you know, but so you do have to keep that in mind as you're figuring out your succession planting as well. Interplanting is growing two or more veg types of vegetables at the same time. Um, so We'll look at some examples of this. So one of the things that you have to think about is, of course, the days to maturity. How long, you know, does plant A take? How long does plant B take? Will they be in competition for nutrients, soil, or nutrients, water, and sunlight? Uh, what type of growth habit do they have? Can is it something that you can underplant? So if you plant kale, you know, it's big, it's there all, all year or you know, all season. You could put spinach under there um, in the spring because it's a cool weather crop. You can, it doesn't have to have direct sun. Uh, you could put some lettuces under there, sort of the, the lower growers. Um, so that's when you, when you think about days to maturity as well as growth habit. The possible negative effects on nearby plants, this is the allopathic piece or companion planting. And there certainly seem to be some plants that don't like each other too much. Um, consider warm season or cool season. So cool is on the shoulders and warm is obviously in the middle. And again, the, the nutrient and light and moisture conditions should be similar. Um, here's uh, two examples of interplanting. So first of all, I think that, you know, it's really nice, but an important concept to remember is the footprint of the plant. When you put the seedling in, and in this case, I think these were all done with seedlings. So maybe, maybe they maybe they did direct seed on the right. But um, you know, if, if you like for the one on the left, so transplants, and remember what the um, the adult the mature footprint looks like, right? You want to make sure that everybody has enough room and they're not squished in there, because that will reduce the amount of air circulation and that can lead to maybe some disease issues. So, uh, so this looks good, pretty nice on the left. There's some kale and some, I don't know, a red, red lettuce or a deco or something in there. So uh, anyway, give it a try. It's fun and you get to make these beautiful, you know, designs. And again, it's an intensive way to garden. So this is my example of, of interplanting. And uh, so I have peas on the, uh, on the left side. You know, I have peas trellised. 
And then I have, so they're almost ready to go. They'll come out soon. To their right and to their left down three feet are blueberries. Um, but blueberry, you know, the peas are in early, the blueberries aren't doing much yet. So there's no competition there. To the left, you see some basil. So the peas will be out of there soon and the basil gets more room. And I also have some weeds, of course. Um, and then some zinnias, uh, I put zinnias in the, in the, uh, in the garden every year because I think they're pretty. So anyway, they bring in they bring in some pollinators, which is which is good for everybody. On the bottom right, let me just say a word about um, buckwheat. That's what that flower is on the left hand side, the white flower, and it's forty five days to maturity. It's really quick. So if I have a bare spot, I'll put in some um, buckwheat just to hold the space. Bring in pot. It's great for pollinators. I have some bees. So, you know, the bees love buckwheat. They'll come and visit and it's, you can just chop it down. It's a great green manure crop. You use it a lot as a cover crop also. And then, you know, I have some flowers and then I have some trellised uh, cucumbers probably it looks like. So again, you know, that, is it too much? Oh, it might be. I mean, I've been accused of stuffing too much stuff in the, in the garden, but you know, I go and trim stuff out from time to time and then everybody's happy. So I think we're okay. Integrated Pest Management or IPM, it's a, it's a concept, it's a way to think about how you're, how you're handling the insects in your bar or the pests in your garden. Do, how am I doing on time? I'm a little, okay, all right, I'm almost finished. Um, so <clears throat> the triangle is again, a nice graphic. You start at the bottom with the least toxic control method. Uh, so this would be cultural in this case, and we'll also show you some examples. And then as you as you go up the pyramid, you know things become a little bit more either hands on or um, at the very top would be chemical. Actually, I'd have a, a different I'd have a second line or a third line in there for biological and then um, maybe maybe chemical. So when you're at the top, that's the most toxic. And when you're down at the bottom, that's sort of the least invasive way that you can control different types of so I'm gonna run through this. These are the cultural, mechanical, and biological, chemical, biological. And then we're gonna look at each one individually. So on the cultural side, site, select, site and plant selection, sanitation and crop rotation are the primary means to, to deal with that bottom rung. As you move up, um, for insects, you're looking at traps and barriers. Row covers are an example of a barrier. Uh, weeds, you know, weeding, mulching, and tilling somehow, you know, take a, an active action in keeping those those weeds down. And then for disease, you're sc always scouting for all of these. But if you see disease, you can also try pruning it out, and that may work depending upon what it is. Um, and then finally, now you're at the apex. So on the biological side, you can use soup soups, soaps, and oils. You know, Sunday soup day, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to pick up my soup on Sunday. Um, so uh, soaps and oils are good biologic. Neem oil is often used uh, in, in insecticidal soap. Conventional chemicals, those are ones that kill on contact. So that's like a spray or a, a, more a spray than even a, a dust. And then there are predators, uh, parasites, and nematodes. And we'll talk about those guys next, I think, or it, in two slides from now. But upper right, it's a great example of, you know, the, the row cover being moved off some kale, so it gets some sun, and then it'll get covered back up again. And then uh, on the bottom, we have a parasitized uh, tomato hornworm, which is a nice example of a biological. So IPM, so this was um, the cultural I guess, right? I can't even read that at the top and I forget. Yeah, so site selection, site and plant selection, the right place for the right plant. So that's really key for any type of, you know, work that you do in your yard, ornamentals, you know, trees, just make sure that you're planting the right thing in the right place. Um, if, it needs, if it needs full sun, put it in full sun. Otherwise, uh, you'll just be like unhappy with the results. So try to, try to do the right thing there. Uh, sanitation. When you're weeding, uh, 
you know, and I'm a bad one for this, but when you weed, you should have a container, put your weeds in the container. And if you're composting and your compost pile gets to 140 degrees, okay, put them in there if they have weed seeds on them, if they have seeds. If they have weed seeds and you're like me, a lazy composter, cold composter, the thing is never gonna heat up. It's just a mound of stuff that you make. Do not put your weeds with seeds in there. Um, because then when you put that stuff back in your garden in a couple of years, you're gonna have seed perfect. The, the weeds will be happy as clams. Um, also, you wanna clean your tools. Uh, I realize that maybe not all of these I would use in the garden, but um, the idea is that you wanna use, uh, I have a spray container and I spray my, my tools with alcohol when I move from bed to bed, and sometimes even from plant to plant, depending upon what I'm up to. Um, so keep things clean. Crop rotation we talked about, and then use a cover crop uh, also. You want, it helps to put nutrients back in the soil, which is better for the organic matter. And, and overall, you know, at the end of the season, you can either in the fall or in the spring, depending upon what cover crop you're using, you can cut it down and turn it back into the soil. And in about three weeks time, you can go ahead and plant in it. So um, again, for from the mechanical and insects, traps and bar uh, traps and um, barriers, which would be the row covers, you know, the remay, the fabric row cover in the summer. And then if you're growing on the shoulders and, you know, you, you need some, a couple degrees of warmth, you know, if you're growing greens on either end, uh, replace that row cover, the, the row cover, the remay with a plastic, and that'll give you a little bit more heat and it'll also keep out some insects. The weeding, mulching, tilling, cultivating, all of those things are considered um, mechanical or physical. And, you know, these are my two favorite tools at the top uh, that I use in the garden. And, First of all, I lose that hoary hoary knife all the time. That's why I have a piece of you know tape around it so I can find it. That pink tape, keep them clean, um, and and use them on a regular basis because it, you know if you go in with that hand hoe and just use the hand hoe, just scraping the surface when the weeds are really small, it you will be very pleased with the um, the number of weeds that you don't have to deal with. So again, uh, the traps. Now, I actually, for the first time, put some, put some traps up for Japanese beetles because I had a bunch of them last year and I didn't feel like picking them all off. It was really annoying. And the trap actually worked pretty well, I have to say. You know, uh, has a pheromone in it and they're attracted to it. And um, they go in there and they can't get out. So I was pretty happy with that. Uh, and if you do have, you know, if you're if some of your, like on tomatoes, if some of your leaves are, are turning, uh, you can prune them off. It's okay, the plant will be fine, okay? And so this is an example of some biological controls that you can purchase ladybugs um, online. And if you're having a problem with white flies, for instance, you can release the ladybugs in the tomato patch. If possible, depending upon, you know, how you're, what, if they're staked or where you're growing them, if you can, Cover, cover them with remay um, or some type of row cover and then release the ladybugs. Then the ladybugs will stay in there for, you know, keep them covered for a day or two and, and then uncover them. But I would definitely try to, you want to keep the, the ladybugs where the problem is for as long as possible. So try to cover them up a little bit. I wouldn't let them out on a, on a really, um, on a wet day or on a really windy day try to let them out on a nice day if possible. In the middle, you have a grub that um, has been infested with nematoids, nematoids. So this is milky spore. Uh, this is what milky spore does. I know you like this one, don't you, Tracy? I can tell. <laughs> it's lots of, it's like, it's all of these are such elegant solutions to such a ratty problem. You know, that's why I get like excited about them. But so what happens is the nematoid is ingested by the grub and they start to reproduce. And as you can see, the nematode, nematodes take over the grub. 
Exactly. So, um, and the good thing about this is that while it will take a while, um, it can take a couple of years, but you build up a, 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 a population of beneficial ne nematodes in your garden. So that's a good thing, but it really, it does take years because, um, it, I mean, it just does. That's how, that's how it works. And last but not least is we have the, um, you have the predatory wasp, the brachinoid wasp, which has laid its eggs on the poor tomato hornworm. I use tomato hornworm because they're, they're vicious and they're voracious eater, not vicious, but they're voracious eaters and they can just skin a tomato plant in no time. You know, so they eat the leaves, they eat the fruit, they just, they make a big mess of everything. So again, um, it's not good news for the, for the hornworm, but it does, it does work and it's uh, a non-toxic solution to this. And you can purchase the, uh, the predatory wasps as well. Whew. So uh, I think we made it. We didn't get the raised bed, which I know I'm really bummed about that, but we'll try to get, maybe we can send a link or something to folks so they can, you can try to see it. That's what uh, I was going to say. I did post it in the chat, but I oh, will. Oh, perfect. That. Okay. I'll, I'll send that in the link to uh, the book um, along with everything else. Okay. And did you get my reference list? I emailed I, it to you earlier today. I will double check. Yeah. Let me know. Because if not, I'll, I'll ask you for that again. Oh, you know what? Okay. Because I, I also emailed you this, um, the presentation. Yeah, I didn't get that. <laughs> okay, all right. Oh, great. Um, okay, so I will, I'll check my email and see what happened. I, I think that's, that's it. So I know we did have a few questions. Um, Denise had mentioned in the chat uh, how to keep hoops under plastic from being crushed with snow. She oh, used yeah, okay. plastic, like in the picture, but they bend. Yeah, okay, so there are a couple things um, that you can do for that. When you, um, before you put over, so you, you install your, um, your hoops. And so, you know, you can have, what kind of hoops do you have, Denise? Go ahead and unmute, Denise, so you can ask yourself if, if you. Uh, use the black, it's a, uh, I think it's called electrical, electrical tubing. Yeah, like the conduit that is flexible. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's flexible. Uh, is we it did... about what? Do you know the diameter? Because the if, if you do like the one inch diameter, that's a little sturdier than some of the other ones. Okay, not there. Water. Can you still I hear say me? It's three Yes, I think it was. Three quarters. I was, asking, I was asking my husband. I think it oh, okay. was. I think it was three quarter. Three okay. quarter in. So, and did you did you put it down with um, you know on the ends? Did you did you put rebar in and then slide the 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 pieces we, over? We put um, clamps on the side of our raised beds and then we slide it into the clamps. Oh, cool! That's great. Okay, so what? So. So that part of it was fine, right? It was well secured. You didn't oh, have yeah. a problem there. Okay. Yeah. And and then did you also, when you uh, weighted down, like at each hoop, you know, insertion, did you put some type of a weight to make it taut? Uh, well, we put long boards along okay. the, the okay. beds. Okay, on top of the of top of the row cover. Yeah, well, it was plastic, you know. It's okay. It's, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. so the last, so all that it sounds good. The and they should be spaced three to four feet apart, no no wider than that, because they definitely will sag. But the last thing, um, well, it's not the last thing actually. It's sort of like the third thing that you want to do is take some heavy twine. And start at one end, at the at the top of the um, at top of the hoop, and just right. take the string all the way down and loop it around a couple of times each, and keep it taut all the way down, 
to the other end of the row. So basically now you have this you know, piece of string that's suspended or tied to each of the hoops, looped around the hoops. And that forms, it's sort of like a ridge pole. On yeah, your, we, we did use you do wood. that? We use oh, wood. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, geez, we, I we, Okay, yeah, tell me what you did. So we wired wood underneath, uh, it was like a one by one, pretty sturdy type of wood. Yeah, okay. underneath, uh, underneath, and we put, our beds are 12 feet long and we put four hoops in each bed. But, you know, two feet of snow, I think it's, uh, it's just so heavy. It, yeah, I, it just the whole thing just collapsed. collapsed. Yeah, and the and then once those hoops bend, you can't bend them back. You can't reuse them. They get that crink, you know, like a. Crink, oh yeah, 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 crink yeah. Crink. And, and so I, I wonder if that white um, PVC would be would not crimp. The only thing we found trying to use the the PVC is it didn't have. Uh, a lot of bend to it. It was pretty oh, stiff. It was pretty stiff. Yeah. I have, I mean, I have to say, I got some metal ones from Johnny's, and they're maybe a half an inch, three quarters of an inch in diameter. Okay. And they they stayed up all this winter. Okay. Now Are I didn't pricey? have um you know, I got them in a raffle. It was like a bidding thing. <laughs> so I know you. I paid, I, I paid more than I should have. It wasn't a raffle, forget it. It was like a silent auction. That's what it was. So, oh, but I really wanted them. It was like the only thing I wanted. Um, but they really have been wonderful. I really like them. So, so I'm going to pop in here for just a second. Cause we're at about um, f a little oh. bit after 5.30. Okay. Um, my one person who had had her hand up and then down and then up and then down, I think she already left, but, um, I will let everybody know if they have extra questions, please email them to me and I'll pass them back on to Diane, but we do have time for maybe one more. If there's something somebody wanted to ask, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, Okay, well, my, my one question was when you're talking about diatomaceous earth, as somebody who grew up around pools, is that the same diatomaceous earth or am I being an idiot? No, you're not being an idiot at all. It's the, the it's, um, that's why I said food grade. So okay. don't use the pool kind, yeah, use that's, the food grade. That didn't sound like a good plan. Okay. Right, <laughs> exactly, right. Um, yeah, and it's almost like a powder. Yeah, I just wanted to yeah. clear up whether that was a thing or not. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I saw beer and I saw diatomaceous earth and I was like, I think I'd go with the beer, but that's just right. me. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's a waste, but yeah. <laughs> but Diane, I just want to say thank you very, very much and huge oh, thank you to everybody for turning out this afternoon. Um, I think it's a wonderful time of year to start planning these things and to have such a, a great person to be able to ask questions. So if you do think of something more, please don't hesitate to reach out. I will send out the recording and the link to the garden bed. Sorry. Yeah. And the book. But okay. Anything? Diane, it's, Diane, yep. it's Charlotte. Thanks a lot. I know oh, a lot, yeah. I know it was a repeat of a lot of Master Gardener stuff, but I need re rep repetition <laughs> to retain it. We all do. It. We Thank all you. do. Trust me. All right. Have a good weekend, Charlotte. You too. Thanks. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. And hopefully we'll see you back here in April to hear about Kayla and the aquaponics in the greenhouse. Sounds good. All right, thanks. Diane, thank you. We'll be back in touch. Okay, sounds good. Enjoy yeah. your weekend, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. See ya.